Okay. Um, well, let me just first uh, of all begin for everyone just to let them know what's going on. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin al-Fatih ilma ughliqa wa al-Khatimi jum'a sabaqa nasir al-Haqqa bil-Haqqi wa al-Hadi ila salatika al-Mustaqeem. Alhamdulillah. So we're back again at the monthly majlis. Um, some familiar faces, some regulars are coming through and MashaAllah, we just said Dr. Jalaja is coming through and we have an influx of people coming through as well. So um, it's either Dr. Jalaja or the topic or both of them. Alhamdulillah. So um, uh, just for uh, those of you who are not aware, Dr. Jalajil uh, is a consultant with the Prince Sultan Research Institute at King Saud University. He has a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Western Cape. Uh, he was a lecturer at Islam of Islamic theology and legal theory at Dara Ulum in Cape Town, South Africa. He wrote a couple of books, uh, Women and Leadership in Islamic Law, Critical Survey of Classical Legal Texts, and Islam and Biological Evolution, uh, Exploring the Classical Sources and Methodologies. And then he has Expressing the Arab, the Presentation of Arabic Grammatical Analysis. Um, already sent out the, um, you guys have access to the paper on the dashboard. There was an updated version of the paper, which he has kindly um, provided us with. It's an expanded version of, or a, uh, maybe a, some parts that were rewritten to be a little bit more clear. And he has highlighted some passages for you to pay special attention to. Um, he also shared um, another paper where he went through um, uh, ethical uh, objections to evolutionary theory. Um, hopefully you guys got to see that. It was a, a kind of a, a quick one that just came through. So if you were able to read that, uh, that'd be good. Uh, it's not overly long. Um, so what we'll do is Dr. Jalaj is going to give uh, a short kind of uh, synopsis of um, the paper. He'll walk us through the main arguments. And um, he already knows that the nature of the majlis is that we'd like to have a conversation and a discussion. So he's assuming that you guys have read the paper at least, um, uh, or given it a once over. If you have any questions, things that you want to bring up, points you want to contend with, um, he understands that this is going to be a conversation back and forth. We'll run this for about an hour to an hour and a half. We'll see how it's going. And um, yeah, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Jirajil. Um I'll just highlight your, spotlight your video. Um, that's what I'm supposed to do? Okay. Yeah, so now you can go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. It's wonderful to be here with you all. I'm looking forward to engaging with you. This is an excellent opportunity for me. And um, I like the idea of being able to exchange ideas back and forth, inshallah. And I hope that I am looking forward to learning something from all of you. Now, to give a background to the topic, uh, my research explores evolution from a classical, traditional Sunni perspective. This means the perspective of the Ash'ari, Maturidi, and Athari Salafi uh, schools of theology. The first two, of course, are your Kalam schools, uh, the, Ath the Ash'ari and Maturidi schools, and the scholars are well known, Imam al-Ghazali, Fakhruddin al-Razi. For the Maturidiya, you have scholars like an Nasafi and Ibn al-Humam. Of course, the Salafis, uh, the most famous scholars for them are, of course, Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn al-Qayyim al, al So what I was asking is if this question of evolution, of biological evolution as understood today, was brought to them under, with the assumption that they understood the uh, science and understood what was going on and were confronted with this question, how would they deal with it? What answer would they give? And that is my point of departure and why I wrote the article to try to get that perspective. So that is a commitment on my part that I will not deviate from uh, the methodologies and approaches of these traditional schools. Before I start talking about human evolution, we need to talk about evolution in general. And that is something I don't discuss in the paper, the paper specific about human evolution. So we all understand what evolution is. And of course, Accepting evolution, human evolution generally implies that evolution in general for all species in life is accepted. And there are people that might accept evolution in general and reject human evolution, but not the other way around. So evolution is the idea that the diversity of species on Earth today, that all diversity of species that we observe 
can be explained by changes in populations over time, over a very long, deep time. And due to causal mechanisms, to cause and effect relationships that take place over time, processes. And that is how the diversity of life came today. It is not a theory of individuals. It's not a theory of the origin of life. It's a theory of the diversity of the species and it deals with populations. The easiest way, the easiest way to understand evolution in general is to consider languages, because that's something we observe in a very short period of time, comparatively speaking. Allah says he created our colors and tongues. So Allah takes full credit for creating language. No one would dispute that. It's in the Quran. English is Allah's creation. French is Allah's creation. Afrikaans is Allah's creation. And we can see languages diversifying, populations of people speaking languages. We speak English. English is a form of German. If you go to Germany, you're not going to understand anybody. How did that happen? A long time ago, populations of German speakers from um, the area between uh, Denmark and the Netherlands moved over to England, met King Arthur and had a big fight and won ultimately and settled there. Now, over time, the population in England could no longer talk to the population in uh, the Netherlands, though before they could. As time went on, new words are coming in, new styles of speaking are coming, ideas are lost, words change in their usage in each population. And this is exactly what happens to living populations. Two populations of the same kind of animal move to different areas and they begin having children, the children look different than their parents, etc. And as time goes on, through different mechanisms that scientists uh, posit for these processes, like uh, mutation, selection, and other mechanisms that they posit, patterns that they posit, the uh, populations drift apart. So we can see it happening with, ink, with, with Dutch and Afrikaans in a, in a very recent history. They are two languages now. They were one language not too long ago. A couple hundred years ago, they were a single language. We see it happening with languages. It takes longer generally with, uh, with, except with microbes, it generally takes longer for these processes to happen between populations of living things until the point comes they can no longer interbreed. And that's what you would call the biological species. So that is what evolution is in general. And now we will turn to the theological issues. Classical theologians, all Muslims, I would say, except for very few, would argue that Allah can do what he pleases, and that Allah is the creator of all things. Definitely, I think all of us here would have that position, and all traditional Muslims would. There is no dispute. This is not even bring, we're not even bringing this up for debate. Everything in existence is God's creation, not just its origin, its continuation is Allah's creation. Whether you're an Ashri occasionalist or on Ibn Taymiyyah's interacting and interlocking uh, natural causes, you still ultimately believe that every last thing is exactly according to Allah's will and according to his power and knowledge and is his direct creation. Nothing is exempted from that. Nothing and no one. That is not even being discussed. Allah created everything, including all living things, of course. So that is what all scholars would agree. Now, how that came about is another question. And to deal with questions of theology, we see that theology is broken down into three categories, traditionally. The ilahiyat, or dealing with knowledge of Allah, knowledge of God. This is where you deal with Allah's names and attributes, and Allah's nature, and what we can know about it, and what we cannot know about it. And in these issues, we all know that uh, the Athari Salafi and the Ashris and Matridis in their hand have very sharp disagreements especially about what aspects of this are known through reason and what aspects are known through revelation. Um, so they all agree that still that God is capable of doing everything possible. However, they come to establish the effect of Allah's existence, etc. They uh, agree on those issues. The second category is nubuat or the prophet, prophetic studies. What is a prophet? How do you determine prophecy? Uh, what is the nature of prophecy? What are the nature of establishing the truth of a prophet? That is another section which has its own lines of evidence. And the third, of course, is sem'iyat. What you have to hear, revelation. What only can be known by way of revelation. 
And this is because it, Allah is capable of all things. Than everything possible, everything conceivable is something Allah can do indisputably. So what he did do from the things that he can do have to be determined by scripture because the human reason, the Ash'aris, Maturidis, and Salafis agree, human reason cannot have anything to say about this. All reason can say, yes, it's possible. Can Allah create unicorns with rainbow horns, like in the car children's cartoon, and walk them around the earth? It's rationally possible. God can do it if he wants to. Whether he did do it, well, either he said he did it, or he didn't say he did it in the scripture. Or if you see something, you can say, well, I saw it myself. That is empirical knowledge. But you cannot, for something that is unseen, for something which is not something you can see, something that you cannot witness, you don't know about it through history or through sensory perception, you have to rely only on Allah for that information. That includes heaven and hell. That includes what's going to happen in the future, in the hereafter. It includes angels and jinn and anything else Allah did not put uh, before our perusal. It includes things of the past that are not recorded in history and that have not left uh, evidence for us to see. These are all matters of the unseen. And the principle for these matters, because Allah He can do what He pleases, is that if we only know about them, what Allah has told us about them. If Allah is silent on the matter, we have nothing to say. We have to say, I don't know. We have to stop. That is tawakkul. And that is the principle that my paper discusses with regard to human evolution. So before we go to human evolution, let's look at evolution in general. The idea that life evolved the way I described it at the beginning of my presentation. You could ask, is it possible for Allah to create life using manifesting these patterns, patterns of natural selection, patterns of random mutation? Because clearly randomness exists in the universe because Allah wants it to. When you roll a dice, it's going to come up differently. There's a pattern there. Can Allah use these patterns to bring about diversity of life? Can he do so? I don't believe any Muslim would say no. Anyone who would say no, according to all traditional theologians, would have to be declared an unbeliever for that basis. Because they're saying Allah is not capable of doing so. They would have to bring a rational argument there. And this would be actually part of the ilahiyat. This question would be in the ilahiyat, not in the semriyat. Is it possible for Allah to do so? And I don't believe any Muslim would say, no, it's not possible. That Allah cannot do it this way. At least not regard. There might be some schools that talk about limiting Allah to certain rational parameters of wisdom, but we're not talking about those schools now. We're talking about traditional Sunni Muslims. And that would be considered kufr by ijma, to say Allah is incapable of this. So what remains is did Allah do it this way? Did Allah bring about the diversity of species the same way that we observe He brought about the diversity of our languages, which He said He created? Then you would say, okay, well, where's the text? Do the text say that he didn't? Or do the text say he did not do it? And when you look at the text, of course, you see Allah takes full credit for creating all living things. There is too, are too many verses to even mention on the matter that he created everything living. So that is indisputable. But the nuts and bolts of the time scale, the manner that it happened, the manner that the diversity of species came about, the Quran doesn't even begin to address those issues. And there were some people, some modernists who try to prove evolution, may try to tease things out of it. And some anti-evolutionists might try to tease some other weird interpretations. That is not what Apita is about. Apita is not about teasing out distant and weird interpretations. It's about taking things on their face value, the law here, and taking it as it is and not interpreting. What does the Quran say? We hear and we obey. We don't, we don't question and we don't interpret or analyze. This is not fiqh. So the Quran is clear that Allah created all life, but is silent on the time scale and manner that it took place. So that means those issues are made, we have to make talk of about. And that is why some ulama today that are very traditional, like Nuh Hamim Keller, well-known Ashari contemporary Muslim thinker, hates evolution. It's clear in his recent book on the Sawwaf and on the article he wrote many years ago, that he hates it and he thinks it's an evil materialistic philosophy. But in spite of his hatred, because of his integrity, he says, I cannot deny evolution in general. He has his own position on human evolution, 
But on evolution in general, you cannot deny it's a possibility because it is mumkin, it is possible for Allah. And that integrity forced him to say, I cannot deny this is possible, that Allah could have done it this way if he wanted to. He is too well, he's too knowledgeable himself to know to, to say anything else. So he did not deny the possibility of evolution. He has to make talk of it. Now, human evolution has a different dimension because with human evolution, we're dealing with the verses that deal with Adam and Eve. And again, we have the same two sets of questions. The question of possibility and the question of did it happen? Did human evolution occur? The first question of possibility is exactly the same. Is it possible for Allah to evolve modern humans, ourselves, from other apes through gradual station, stages where you have something like a basic ape form that over time populations of them diversify and change until some populations start looking more and more like us. Is it possible for Allah? I would hate to meet the Muslim that says it's not possible. For Allah. That Allah cannot do it that way. He doesn't have the power or it's inconceivable that that would be his will to do it. That I don't believe anyone is going to be bringing that argument up. Though some people come close. Some people have come close to that without actually saying it. So uh, that would not force that on them and make tech fear or anything. I don't believe in doing things like that. Those that say that the reason why human beings are different, the reason why we have to deny human evolution is because look at the human mind. The human has imbued with a soul. The human being has reason and rationality that no other living organisms have, according to them. And we are separate from every other living thing. And we are honored in a special way. And that proves that we did not evolve. If they're trying to imply that Allah cannot bring about this exact suite of features, of spiritual features and intellectual features, and cannot honor a creature that he wishes to honor. He cannot do that if it evolved from apes. If he evolved it from an ape, then that's limiting Allah. And they're trying to argue that Allah can't do it that way and bring about this result. That would be that kind of argument. Now, I would not push that, though some people have made arguments that sound like that, I would never push that on anybody. Because that would be too dangerous. Do you even think that someone is actually going to claim that Allah can't do it? So we're left again with the same issue. The issue, of course, being, did Allah do it that way? Did Allah create this species, this biological organism, this population from a gradual process of evolution, or did he not do it? And we're saying this from a religious standpoint. Now, the issue of Adam and Eve is what comes up here, and that's what makes this different than evolution in general. The only thing that actually makes it different. Not that humans have souls, because whether animals have souls or not is an issue ulama have made to Allah for them. It's only the issue of, did Allah do it? We have texts that might indicate, no, he didn't. And those texts are the texts that deal with Adam and Eve. Peace be upon him. Now, we have, I assume we've all read the article, and you can see the entire argument given from the text, where the conclusion is that the law here of the text is that Adam was created without parents. So was Eve. And that all living people on earth today, those who are addressed by revelation, are descendants of Adam and Eve. And we have all the verses. You, there's no one clear statement that says all that, but there's the verses of the Quran, the Hadith that refer to the verses. There are the, the concept that were called Beni Adam. All these things taken together create a very strong law here. I wouldn't say it's cocky, but it's a very strong law here, enough to establish a feeder with it. That Adam and Eve do not have parents, and that Every human being on earth today, without exception, is a descendant of Adam and Eve. That is what the verses are saying. That is what the texts are saying, according to the law here. Now, and that is what traditional Muslims have actually concluded on these issues with, from based on the law here of the texts. Now, so we can say that is the official position of the Ash'ari, Maturidi, and Salafi ulama on this issue. And that... Of course, you know, my paper does not dispute that at all. I don't go into other possibilities. I'm not denying that other people can't make possibilities, but that would be outside of the parameters that I set for myself. And now we have to deal with the issue, well, what about human evolution? And that brings us to the second part of the discipline. Now, the discipline of Tawakov is a discipline. This I don't emphasize in the paper. It is difficult. Tawakov is not easy. Aqidah is not easy. That's why it's a dangerous field, because you're talking about Allah. 
Ibn al-Qayyim, sending off the, off the topic a little bit, wrote a book on usul al-fiqh. Fiqh. Fiqh is not is less than a fiqh. It's how to make wudu. Yes, it's important. I'm not limiting its importance at all. But it's not as dangerous as a fiqh. Because you deal with dhan, and you deal with extrapolation and interpretation. You reject hadith because they go against general principles in certain methods. You do lots of things in fiqh you would never do in a fiqh. You speculate. You have to. We have to know how to pray. That there's two conflicting hadith. We don't know which one to do. What do we do? You have to do something. That's not the, that's what you have amal, you have work, you have action that depends on coming to an answer. Where an apida is not based on amal, it's based on beliefs. So you leave things alone. It's a big difference. But he still called his book to show the danger of giving a fatwa, signing in God's name, signing in Allah's name. When you're saying, when someone asks me, uh, is it halal or haram? They're not asking David Jalaja, what is your opinion about wudu or about gender changes or whatever else they might be asking about. They're saying, what is Allah's opinion? What is Allah saying about this? That's dangerous. I don't know why people like giving fatwa. People used to run away from it, the Sahaba. This is fatwa in fiqh, not in a feeder. It's an excellent a book. is a guide to those who would sign in God's name. Now, a is even more dangerous. So you have to be more cautious about this. So the discipline of the walk is difficult because when you hear a narrative, why tell you that Zaid woke up in the morning in his apartment on 17th Street in New York and he put the kettle on? You have an image in your head. The kettle has a color. His bed you had an image of, the room, everything. When you hear a story, you automatically fill in the blanks. It would be impossible for human beings to accept any narrative psychologically without that capacity. But none of those things were stated by me. Now, when you hear a story like the story of Adam and Eve, it doesn't matter if the stories are true or false. The brain processes are the same. You fill in the blanks. And an Aqidah scholar has to undo that. When it terms what Allah is saying and what he is not saying, it is a discipline. It is a difficult discipline, and it's easy to fail at this discipline. So what are these verses and texts not saying? They're not saying anything about what Adam and Eve saw when they came to earth what or who they may have interacted with, or how they may have interacted with those beings. It says nothing about the time scale. How long ago was it? Was it 6,000 years ago, like some people argue? Was it 10,000, 100,000, 200,000, 800,000? We don't know. It's not important to our faith. Allah would have mentioned it if it was. So you have to make tawakkuf about everything that is not stated. Now, when someone says evolution is false, human evolution is false, and they're saying it from a scientific basis, I have nothing to argue about here. I mean, personally, I have my own position on science and my own understanding of the theory, and I'll have my own personal opinion scientifically. But this is not what we're not talking about. Again, when someone asks you as a sheikh or as a scholar, as a student of knowledge, what is the Islamic position on this topic? They're asking you, what does Allah say about it? What does Allah require us to believe about it? It's a different type of question. And so you have to be very careful. So when you say evolution is false, human evolution is kufr, or anything else you might say, it's actually making a claim about Allah. Allah did not evolve beings that are biologically human from other apes. It did not happen. It did not happen. Allah did not do it. And it is false to claim he did do it. That requires very direct evidence. You're making a claim about Allah, and that claim requires evidence. Now, because I assume that everyone has read the article, I believe I'd like to, I'm eager to hear what everyone else has to say, so I would like to uh, finish talking now. I've taken up too much time as it is, and I'm eager to hear from all of you.